The house was a wonder, an old lighthouse, still functional, renovated into an Airbnb. We got it. The water such a deep green it drew you close, to the edge of a cliff. A whole wall of nothing but windows looked out over the ocean. Drawing near to the opening, I saw a wraparound deck with a hot tub. Daisy, what do you think? It's amazing, Dan. Dan went out of his way to get this place. He even invited my two best friends to join us. Star and David came in the door at that moment. Oh, what a view! Star ran over and pressed her nose against the glass, leaving a nose print. She giggled. Dan brought us all a drink. To Daisy, the reason we're all here. He toasted. I felt a blush creep up my neck. Sure, it's my birthday, but he's the one that rented the place and got us here. Best weekend ever, Star said in my direction. I smiled, raised my drink, and drank it. We spent the rest of the day exploring our surrounding, bickering over who got what room. Dan and I got one just below the light with a gorgeous view while Star huffed. We ended the night in the hot tub, staring out at the stars, smelling the salt and listening to the waves crash against the cliff face below us. The result was so calming I don't remember going to the bed. I must have though, I woke up to a beautiful sunrise. The room was filled with golden light. Who could believe that this was real life? Not me. I stretched feeling how loose my body felt. Who knew a body could hold so much tension? I slid out of bed and made my way downstairs where I heard the others whispering. But should we tell her? Tell me what? I came around the corner and saw Star's face start to burn. David looked quickly away, but Dan smiled. Oh, nothing, just a silly note we found this morning. How are you feeling? What note? Dan passed a piece of paper over. It read, Happy Birthday, and had a drawing of a daisy. Weird thing was, it wasn't in any of their handwriting. That's odd, I handed the paper back. Nah, I think I told the owners why we were renting the place. They probably left it and we just didn't notice it until this morning. Dan shrugged. Star and David didn't look convinced, but it's the beach. What bad could happen there that didn't come from the water? Let's go walk on the sand. We spent the morning on the beach, enjoying the sand and salt air, until we realized none of us had eaten. So we headed back to the house, only to find the door wide open. Dan thought that perhaps we just hadn't closed it tightly enough. David was positive he'd locked it. The boys went in and looked around while Star and I waited in the yard for the all clear. After a few minutes, David waved us in. We were so hungry, we ate our breakfast like a monster would. An hour later, Has anyone seen my bikini? Star came into the sunroom flushed. We'd all decided the hot tub was needed and had changed and were waiting for Star. We all shook our heads. I hung it up last night, but now I can't find it. I have an extra if you want, I shrugged. She nodded. It's in my suitcase, go for it. You guys don't have to wait for me. I stared at her thoughtfully, but she waved me away. As she turned and walked up the stairs, I turned and headed for Serenity. After about 20 minutes, we realized Star never joined us. Maybe I should go check on her, I hesitated. David shook his head. No, I will. He climbed out, wrapped himself in a towel, and headed inside. Dan took my hand. I looked into his smile. He made me feel safe. But why would I not? We heard a shout and another sound I will never forget. The sound of something heavy hitting the wood deck. It sounded like a watermelon had burst. I screamed as I looked down to see Star, or what was left of her, on the deck. It seemed she'd thrown herself from the light room at the top of the house. I ran for the bathroom, emptying my stomach once I arrived. I wiped my mouth and washed my hands. When I looked up in the mirror, I screamed again. There was a note written in red on the mirror. There was another drawing of a daisy. Dan came skidding in. I just pointed at the note. The very next thing we did was call the police. They did their investigation said it was a suicide, but they didn't know Star like I did. She wouldn't do that. Where had David gone anyway? The police promised to look for him as the coroner's van took my best friend's body away. 
I felt numb. Shaking off all of Dan's comfort, I told him I was going to lay down for a while. Rage seemed to flash across his face, but before I could be sure, it was gone. I woke just as the sun was setting. I looked in my suitcase. The extra swimsuit was there, along with a note. Something's wrong, Daisy. Very wrong. No drawing this time, just my name, and it was in David's handwriting. What could he mean? I took the paper and headed downstairs. Done skulking, are you? Dan was slurring. I just saw my best friend splattered. I wasn't sulking. Have you been drinking all day? So what if I have? I walked to the window. When did David come back? There he was, sitting in the hot tub, without a care that his girlfriend was dead. Dan giggled. Why don't you ask him? I opened the door, my hair raising as I walked out. There was a heavy scent of iron in the salt air. David? Nothing. No response. I crept closer. Something felt very wrong. David? It came out as a whisper this time. Suddenly I saw the reason for the scent of iron. David's throat was cut. I took a deep breath to scream, and a hand snaked around my waist, the other covering my mouth. I wanted this all to be special, but they were going to ruin it. Now they can't. You're mine, and there's nothing they can do about it. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Dan was babbling and giggling. He was pulling me back toward the railing. I froze, limp in his arms. He dropped his hand from my mouth. Why? I whispered. As Dan's grip tightened around my waist, I felt the warmth of his breath against my ear, his voice cold and unnerving. Why? He whispered back, mimicking my question. Why not? I struggled, trying to free myself, but his hold was firm. You see, Daisy, he continued. This was all for you. Everything. The lighthouse, the birthday weekend, even Star and David. Especially them. I managed to turn my head just enough to catch a glimpse of his eyes, dark and twisted with a madness I had never seen before. I, I don't understand, I stammered, my voice trembling. He chuckled softly, a chilling sound that echoed in the night air. Of course you don't. How could you? Star and David? They were distractions, obstacles. They needed to be removed so you could see how much I love you, how far I would go for you. I felt a wave of nausea. You killed them because you loved me? That's insane, Dan! His eyes flickered with a dangerous light. No, Daisy, it's not insane. It's devotion. I had to make sure you knew there was no one else but me. Now, there's no one left to come between us. He began to drag me towards the edge of the deck, towards the cliff. Panic surged through me as I realized his intent. I struggled harder, adrenaline fueling my efforts. Please, Dan, don't do this. But he was relentless. I wanted to make this a special birthday, one you'd never forget, he hissed. And it will be for both of us. As we reached the edge, I knew I had only moments to act. I stomped hard on his foot, surprising him enough to loosen his grip. I twisted free and ran, my heart pounding, but Dan was right behind me. I ran back into the house, slamming the door and locking it. My mind raced. I needed a weapon, something to defend myself. I grabbed a kitchen knife and turned to face the door, waiting for him to break through. Silence. Then a slow, deliberate knock. Daisy, Dan called out, his voice eerily calm. You can't hide from me. You belong to me. My grip tightened on the knife as I backed away my eyes darting around for another escape. Suddenly, I remembered the light room at the top of the house. If I could reach it, maybe I could signal for help. I bolted up the stairs, my heart in my throat. Behind me, I heard the door splinter as Dan forced his way in. I reached the top and locked the door, then rushed to the light controls, frantically trying to turn it on. 
The light flickered to life, casting a powerful beam across the dark ocean. But it wasn't enough. I needed something more immediate. I looked around and saw the radio, the one used to communicate with passing ships. I grabbed it, my hands shaking, and sent out a distress signal. Help! This is Daisy at the, at the old lighthouse Airbnb. I, I'm being attacked! Please send help! A voice crackled back almost instantly. Help is on the way. Stay calm and stay safe. Just then, the door behind me burst open. Dan stood there, his face twisted in fury. You think you can call for help? You think anyone will get here in time? I backed away, holding the knife in front of me. Stay back, Dan! Don't come any closer! He stepped forward, a sinister smile spreading across his face. You know, Daisy, I almost regret this. Almost. But if I can't have you, no one will. And then, in a moment of pure desperation, I lunged at him with the knife. We struggled, and I felt the blade sink into flesh. Dan's eyes widened in shock as he stumbled back, clutching his side. Blood poured from the wound as he fell to the floor. I dropped the knife, my hand shaking uncontrollably. Why, Dan? Why did you do this? His breaths were shallow and labored. Because, Daisy, you were always meant to be mine. His voice trailed off as his eyes glazed over. I sank to the floor, sobbing uncontrollably. The light from the lighthouse continued to sweep across the ocean, a beacon of hope and despair. The sound of sirens grew closer, but it was too late. The birthday weekend, meant to be a celebration, had turned into a nightmare. And I was left with the horrifying realization that the man I thought I loved was a monster. As the police arrived and began their investigation, they found one final note, hidden in Dan's belongings. It was a drawing of a daisy, with a message scrawled beneath it in handwriting that wasn't Dan's. You're not the first, Daisy, and you won't be the last. I met a really hot guy named Tyson on OkCupid. We chatted for a bit, and he seemed like the perfect guy. Handsome, successful, funny. I'd just gotten out of a horrible relationship with my ex-boyfriend Raymond, and I really needed to get back into the dating scene. We arranged to meet up on a Friday night. I got a new outfit, a haircut, and determined to make a good first impression. We were supposed to meet at a fancy fresh restaurant in town, but when I pulled into the parking lot, I saw that the building was closed. Tyson stood the entrance, with an apologetic look in his face. I'm so sorry, he said. Today's Bastille Day over in France, so I guess it's closed? I thought you made a reservation. He shrugged. If he weren't so handsome, I'd be really annoyed. He pointed over to a McDonald's across the street and asked if we could go there instead. I was way overdressed for a fast food restaurant and I did not want to eat burgers and fries on a first date. But I didn't want to come across as difficult, so I nodded and we walked across the street. I hadn't been inside a McDonald's in years. I didn't eat red meat, and I hated anything greasy. When we got to the counter, I ordered chicken nuggets and a Coke. Tyson got a combo meal. When we sat down, Tyson apologized for how the night was turning out. I assured him that everything was okay, but... I think he could tell I was annoyed. We chatted for a while as they made our food, and my annoyance quickly disappeared. Tyson seemed like such an interesting person. He told me all about his job as a speech therapist and his travels through Europe. Even though we were all alone in a greasy smelling McDonald's, I was really enjoying our time together. We got our food and I ate a couple of nuggets before giving up. I didn't like them. Tyson wasn't eating much either. Slowly, the conversation shifted towards my life. Tyson asked me about my job and my family. My life wasn't nearly as exciting as his, especially since I'd spent the last few years with Raymond. One of the worst parts about our relationship was how he stopped me from doing anything that I wanted to do. When I was still with Raymond, 
We always hung out with his friends, did what he wanted to do. He'd constantly make fun of my interests. It felt so great to finally talk to a guy who seemed genuinely curious about my life. Things were going so well until Tyson asked me about my sister, Tara. I immediately knew that something was wrong. How did he know my sister's name? I tried to think back of our text messages. Maybe I mentioned Tara and forgot about it? I had to be certain. So I said, she's still in Nebraska. She's doing great. Oh, Tyson said. I thought she lived in Washington. She did. The Nebraska comment was a lie. And now I knew for sure that Tyson was keeping tabs on me. He looked confused. What's wrong? How do you know where my sister lives? Tyson nervously looked around the restaurant. Then he looked me right in the eyes and said, I'm sorry. I didn't know what was going on, but I felt unsafe. I threw down my napkin and walked towards the door. Wait, he called after me. I didn't. Tyson jumped out of his chair and raced towards me. He grabbed me by the shoulders and pulled me back inside. Get off me, I screamed. The cashier was in the kitchen, and I prayed that he could hear my screams and come running. Stop, Tyson said, as I struggled to pull out of his grip. Just listen, okay? Who are you? I demanded. I'm Tyson, he said. I didn't lie to you about that, but your boyfriend Raymond, he's my cousin. He convinced me to take you here. Now that his face was close to mine, I could see the resemblance. Tyson had the same dark, wide-set eyes as my ex. I pushed him with all my strength and ran back toward the door. He's waiting outside, Tyson screamed. I froze, slowly turning around. That was part of his plan, Tyson explained. I'd lure you here, and then when you left, he'd grab you from the parking lot. He wants his money back. His money? Tyson explained that I drained my ex-boyfriend's bank account and ran away with all his money. None of that was true, of course. Raymond had lied to him about everything. I'm so sorry, he said. I know you've taken thousands of dollars, but I can't be a part of this. What made you change your mind? I don't know, getting to know you? Even though you made mistakes, you still seem like a good person, he said. The McDonald's workers still hadn't come out of the kitchen. We were alone in the restaurant and Raymond was lurking somewhere outside. I stood my ground and waited for Tyson to back up a bit. Eventually he did. Slowly I explained that everything that his cousin told him was wrong. I never stole from Raymond. I left because he was a controlling, abusive jerk. I could tell by his expression that he finally believed me. Even though Raymond was his relative, Tyson took my word over his. He apologized for putting me in this situation and promised that he'd protect me. Together we walked outside to talk to Raymond. With Tyson next to me, I didn't feel afraid. I could tell that he was a much better person than his cousin. I saw someone move behind the dumpsters. I knew it was Raymond waiting for me. Let me talk to him alone, Tyson offered. No, I said. We'll talk to him together. We both walked towards the dumpsters, but the man who was standing there wasn't Raymond. He was the McDonald's worker. He spun around when we approached him with both his hands raised in the air, like he'd been caught in the middle of a crime. It was an accident. I swear. I was just checking out the trash. I, I didn't see him. Tights and I ran over to the dumpster to look inside and almost threw up. Raymond was in the dumpster. I guess that was his hiding spot. A large broken microwave was embedded into the side of his head. When the worker had thrown it out, he dropped it right on Raymond, killing him. I looked at Tyson who was sitting down in horror at his dead cousin as he started to cry. I called 911 and explained what happened. Thankfully the worker wasn't charged for any crimes and Raymond's death was ruled an accident. This all happened months ago. Tyson and I are actually still together. He's a much better boyfriend than Raymond, and I've never been happier.
Last summer, I took a road trip by myself from California to my cousin's wedding in Texas. Normally, I'd just fly there, but the plane tickets were surprisingly expensive. I'd always wanted to do a road trip, so I figured that this was the perfect opportunity. I drove for a day straight before stopping at a hotel in New Mexico for the night. The next morning, I woke up early and continued the drive. I brought a bunch of snacks with me so that I didn't have to keep stopping for meals, but by that second afternoon, I really needed a break. I was in the middle of the desert when I saw a sign for a rest stop up ahead. I pulled off the highway into an area with public bathrooms, a gas station, and a McDonald's. I don't particularly like fast food, but it was the only restaurant for miles. So I parked outside the McDonald's and headed in. There were a few truckers inside, but it was mostly empty. I went up to the counter, where a pimply-faced teenager was waiting to take my order. His name tag said, Asa. I asked for a chicken nugget combo and then paid in cash. Asa seemed pleasant enough, but he kept glancing over his shoulder to the kitchen behind him. I just assumed that he was a new employee and didn't want to mess up. I sat near the window and waited for my food. After a few minutes, I heard some commotion in the kitchen. It sounded like a woman's voice was screaming, and a man's voice was quietly apologizing. I glanced over at the truckers, who were all standing up to leave. They ignored the commotion. I figured I should, too. But once they were gone and I was the only customer left, the screaming got louder. I couldn't make out specific words, but it sounded like the world's worst boss lashing out at her poor employee. Ugh, I felt absolutely terrible for that pimply kid. I knew it wasn't any of my business, but I couldn't stop myself. I stood up and I walked back to the counter. I tried to peer around the corner into the kitchen, but I didn't see anyone. The screaming stopped, and then I heard something heavy crash to the floor. The male voice, presumably Asa, whimpered in pain. It sounded like his boss had thrown something at him. Without thinking, I jumped over the counter and ran into the kitchen. The cashier was lying on the ground, a metallic shelf pressed on top of him. I didn't see the woman anywhere. I raced toward him and pushed the shelf to the side. Then I helped him to his feet. He didn't seem hurt, aside from one bloody scratch on his shoulder. Are you okay? I asked. My boss hates me, Asa mumbled. Where is she? You can't put up with that kind of abuse. His face got really scared. <sighs> Don't talk about her like that. It'll just make her angry. Please, go back to your table before she sees you. He started pushing me out of the kitchen. I wanted to help, but it seemed like the kind of situation where my interference would only make things worse. So I did as he told me and went back to my table. A minute later, the young guy came back out with my tray of food. He was limping as he approached my table. He dropped off my tray, muttered, I'm sorry, and then hurried back into the kitchen. He still looked scared. I started eating my chicken nuggets, silently telling myself to mind my own business. In a situation like this, the best thing I could do was stay out of it and then complain to the corporate office once I left the restaurant. I had two pieces of chicken before I noticed a weird liquid. I looked down at the half-eaten nugget in my hand and I saw a big glob of spit hanging off of it. I spat out everything that was in my mouth. The worker came back, asking if everything was okay. I guess he heard me spit. I showed him the evidence, and he just looked down at his feet. I'm so sorry, he mumbled. My, my boss must have heard you trying to help me. I think she's angry at you. Well, now I had to say something. Where is she? I asked. No, Asa told me. You'll make things worse. Just let me make your order again and refund you for the trouble. I ate spit, I told him. I'm not going to ignore this. I pushed past him and charged back into the kitchen. I looked everywhere, but the woman wasn't there. Asa came up behind me. She's outside. Let me go talk to her. Before I could say anything, he raced out the back of the restaurant. The door thudded shut behind him. I stood there for a minute, planning out what I was going to say to this woman. When the door swung open... 
and Asa limped back inside by himself. He was bleeding from the side of the head, little bits of glass sticking out. She's... she's crazy, he gasped, and then he collapsed onto the ground. I ran over to see if he was okay. He was still breathing, but blood was leaking down his face. It looked like he'd been hit in the head with a bottle. I pulled out my phone and dialed 911. A female voice answered, and I said, I'm in the McDonald's off Route 95. Before I could explain what was happening, the woman sighed loudly and said, Let me guess. The teen who's working there just got attacked by his mysterious unseen boss, right? How did you know? I asked her. She sighed again. Just check the body. Then she hung up. I looked down at Asa's bloody face. His breathing was so weak and raspy. Then, all at once, his eyes opened and he jumped to his feet. He gave me a little bow, still dripping blood that was obviously fake. What the hell? I screamed. It was all made up? And I wasn't the first person he'd done this to. He'd pretended to get murdered so many times that the police didn't even respond anymore. I was speechless. I slowly backed away from him as he kept bowing over and over. I needed to get out of there. I hopped into my car and drove off. I wasn't hungry anymore. <laughs>